Thank you for asking me to talk about the journey to Campro, the safe, simple and affordable transperineal biopsy system. Innovation in the NHS is touted by nearly everyone across organizational levels. But how to do that innovation, and more important, how to get that implemented, is actually pretty poorly understood. The journey of the CAM probe is one of a discovery by myself, because there really wasn't any signposts on how to achieve it. And although there are many organizations that exist to try and assist, the truth is that you don't really understand the various steps and hurdles until you start the journey. And hopefully, my present today, presentation today will give you an insight at least into my own journey in this area. The first important thing when you think about an innovation is that it best comes from someone who recognizes a problem in their day-to-day -day practice. There are many problems we all face in health services, in the NHS in particular, and trying to quantify that is actually quite important. Because what may seem to be a problem for us may not be a problem in the wider NHS. And often what is a problem in one place may not be a problem somewhere else. In other words, someone may already have the answer for what you want to do. And really, you need to think about the solution to that problem which your innovation is trying to address. And you need to, at the beginning, start by understanding what you're trying to solve, how much it's going to cost, what the team you're going to have to assemble to do that, how you're going to prove it's acceptable because there are many levels of regulatory hurdles. Ironically, it's actually easier to come in as a company with a device than it is to innovate uh, from the shop floor, as it were, because we, as clinicians, often uh, require the evidence, usually from research, to give us that confidence uh, in the product we're asked to use. In terms of uh, the Campro, which is a prostate biopsy device, it starts out starts off by trying to understand what is the burden of need. And prostate biopsy to diagnose prostate cancer is in fact a very large disease burden. UK alone, and this data is slightly out of date, over 80,000 procedures per year are performed and is projected to reach over 130,000 by 2030. Across the Western world, more than a million biopsies are performed. And we know that the rate of prostate cancer is also increasing with one in eight men due to receiving. Uh, a diagnosis of prostate cancer. The market share for biopsy costs is also pretty enormous. In the UK alone, just the diagnostic side of things is about 51 million, and in Europe, uh, nearly uh, half a billion in terms of costs. So in terms of a space for innovation and a case for need, there is actually quite a large market for this. But the current way we were doing prostate biopsies, which is the transrectal route illustrated by this image here on the left, was prone to two particular problems. The most important is that standard biopsies through the transrectal route had an infective complication rate of about 10 to 12 percent, with about 1 to 4 percent of men with a risk of severe sepsis. There's also the possibility of missing cancers, but that's largely been addressed more by better imaging than by any particular technique of biopsies. So in prostate biopsy terms, we were facing these particular problems. The technique of a transrectal biopsy em emerged around the 80s, and in fact, before then, people were doing the transperineal route, uh, which is what the CAM probe is based on. But because it was easy to do, and because the, if you go about the dentate line in the anatomy, uh, there's no pain, it became the preferred way of doing biopsies. And in the UK, um, and the US, and everywhere else, it is the mainstay of diagnosis. However, as I mentioned, there is a risk of infection and sepsis, and this study, which is now over 10 years old, showed that about 1,800 to 2,600 men were having sepsis diagnosed after a biopsy, costing the NHS about 7 to 11 million a year. Not only that, uh, there is obviously the risk of resistance to antibiotics, which are required routinely before biopsies, and resistance to antibiotics, particularly quinolones. And this study from Carignan et al., again about uh, 11 years ago, showed a rising a resistance to the infective organisms that we see and therefore requiring more sophisticated antibiotics or admissions. The transperineal route, which avoids putting the biopsy needle to the rectum and goes to the perineum, which is the space between the legs, as you can see illustrated, is a much safer route because sepsis rates are as low as less than 0.1% and infection rates less than 1%. When I first started in prostate biopsies and as a consultant, the only way to do transperineal biopsies was under general anaesthetic using this grid placed against the perineum with multiple biopsy punctures being inserted. 
And of course, this is very painful. When you think about perhaps 10 to 20 samples being taken through the skin, this really was not a very good way to be able to try to do it under local anesthetic. So we had a better, safer route, but it was more painful, requiring general anesthetics. Inevitably, of course, that meant that the cost for a transrectal biopsy was much cheaper than the cost for a general anesthetic transperineal biopsy. So the question really was how uh, do you bridge that gap between the transrectal biopsy, the simplicity of doing it in the outpatient setting, um, well tried and tested, many thousands done every year, but and replace that with a safer transperineal route, which uh, it certainly wasn't feasible to have all the cases being done under a general anesthetic, with all the risks that that involved, as well as the costs and the overnight stays. Pilot study uh, in our hospital, and it was very interesting to find out that because we developed and made the device in our hospital, we didn't need NHRA approval. And we effectively showed that it could be used safely to take prostate biopsies in a study of about 30 patients. Compared to transrectal biopsies, we had no fevers or shivers or aseptic events. Pain scores were very acceptable, and patients who had previously had a transrectal biopsy much preferred the camphorobe approach. So this pilot study, which was published um, in 2018, actually, from a study which was started in 2016, showed us the proof of principle that such a coaxial system designed for biopsies through the transperineal route was feasible. Of course, the next step then is how do you make this a reality into the NHS? We put together that pilot data and we applied to the, to the NIHR Eye for Eye program and was successful, thankfully, and that's what led to the eventual development of disposal material, which I'll come to in a while. Here we have the timeline of the pre eye for eye award steps. Um, we had a patent application as early as 2014, the innovation in ACP award in 2014 and 15, the CAM probe trial, uh, and, and um, the patent application was approved at the National Office in 2017. We got awarded the I4I award in 2017 and developed these various steps, the study protocol for trial, clinical study, healthy economic evaluation, and ultimately CE marking. We were obviously uh, delayed in terms of the endpoint, as you can see that was 2020, and that was primarily due to COVID and huge changes in the regulatory landscape recently with Brexit. Now, one of the key things when we were looking at developing the CAM probe, it wasn't just about developing a device, because I recognized that simply producing something uh, and putting it out there was not going to gain traction, because you were trying to change the entire paradigm of how people actually looked at trans uh, of prostate biopsies. So we really did a number of key steps. The simplest in many ways was the development of the disposable CAM probe. But we also needed to develop a training package, and we did that with the video instructions in the I4I. Most importantly, for clinicians to adopt and take up our device, they need to see clinical evidence of efficacy. And so we had to do a trial. And within that trial, we also got clinical evaluation, patient feedback, and very importantly for any device to market was health economics as well. And so all of these things, I like to think of it as an onion, uh, an onion layer project, is what then led on to the CAM probe CE mark and where we are now at the stage of commercialization. Now the team you have to assemble to do this is actually quite complicated. And I would advise anyone thinking of an innovation to think about all of these aspects at the start and not do it step by step. Because if you do that, you will come across barriers which you didn't know about and that would likely stop your project in its track. But first, of course, is the idea and the concept. If it's coming from the clinic, you need to make sure that you can actually uh, develop it and test it in a setting. So you need people with the expertise, the clinical training. You should be doing a trial, for which case you need a trials unit. And of course, clinical engineering is an important partner. Now, you may be working uh, with a commercial company that can do all of that, but working with your own hospital's clinical engineering team allows you to sort of prejudge some of the things that hospitals look for in devices. The next, of course, is IP marketing and commercialization. If you are an inventor working in a hospital or a non-commercial uh, uh, area, then you may not have these things to hand. And partnering with a, a body which does that, in my case, Health Enterprise East, is hugely important because it is a very complicated area. The IP, how you market, commercialization. And of course, with device development, again, if you're not already working within uh, a company that produces things, you need someone to help you divide, device design and engineering, and we were happy to partner with Jeb for that. Health economics is important, particularly if you want to get nice recognition or adoption, and getting that early on is very important, and we actually did a, a full economic evaluation. 
and finally patient representatives as part of PPI. This was hugely valuable to us because the I4I itself I think only passed through the gateposts because the patient representatives on the award panels really thought that this was going to make a big difference to patients. So getting patients involved in the study <coughs> and the study progress I would strongly suggest is important and all men and all these partners should be part of your trial management group. You really also have to start thinking about the future from the start. Uh, I briefly put this up to tell you about the things you need to think about such as development, how you're going to introduce it to growth, further funding, <coughs> who you might partner with to take your product to market. All these things are really important to plan at the start so you have what I call the line of sight to where it might work clinically in the future. Finally, although it's not usual for clinicians to think about economics, I mentioned already that you know part of the bigger picture is to understand what the consumer market is. If you produce a very expensive device with a small market, it's probably unlikely to gain traction. Or if you produce, or you have a very large market, but your device is actually uh, in a very competitive field, it can be very difficult to get there. So we were able to. Look at this with the CAM probe in terms of potential revenues and return on investments, again modelling based on the kind of numbers which I told you about uh, initially. And for example, in the UK, we estimated the total addressable market for consumables of about 51 million. Uh, the consumable bit of that, the biopsy device, is about 4 million. And even if the CAM probe gained 20% of that market, we thought about 1 million in terms of trading profits. And if you then included lowered sepsis compared to transrectal, you would save even more money. So we estimated that within the first year of a 20% uptake of a final product, uh, it might save the NHS twice the investment amount from I4I. And this might be multiplied many times if you, for example, go to the European or the US markets. This is a very brief schematic of the I4I study as we laid it out, which is obviously now completed. This was based on six work packages, including design and development on the left, risk assessment, Training materials, as I said, we produce videos and written material, uh, a proper regulatory approved study from the MHRA, health economics, and that all led up to the CE marking. And the project was over three years. Now, obviously, to cut to the chase, we finally developed the disposable CAM probe after an £800,000 investment through the NIHR program. And the device itself is simplicity. It is effectively a, a designed and um, specifically manufactured uh, for the perineal access system, um, a coaxial cannula with a flexible plastic base and integrated simultaneous local anesthetic delivery needle. Um, and really, when you look at it, it's hard to actually make many claims about it uh, in terms of its um, innovation. But as it turned out, there were a number of features which allowed it to be patented. Now, um, you can actually watch the Campro video and the procedure using this QR code, but in effect, it does what it says in the tin. It allows us to access to the perineum under local anesthetic um, with quite low pain scores and to biopsy from different areas of the prostate. As part of our I4I program, we arrange a training day with six centers to come on board, and this is quite important because if we develop something which only you can use, then it's probably not going to be much use. So being able to get it disseminated and adopted and making sure people can actually train to use it is actually very important. The clinical trial is also important to validate what your claims are. Effectively, if you're saying that we should be able to reduce infections, then actually doing a trial with a reasonable number of powered patients, which this study was with 40 patients, we were in fact able to show uh, that there were absolutely no infections or sepsis episodes. So we actually proved the, the primary outcome. The median pain scores were low, 3 out of 10, so you remember that one of the issues with the general anesthetic method was that it was painful. And patients recommended it. Now, although we didn't look at this primarily, the cancer detection rates were actually also very good, and the procedure was comparable to the transrectal as well, about 25 minutes. And local anesthetic use was low. If you remember, the design of the device is such that once you put the, ca the coaxial cannula, repeatedly putting in the biopsy needle means there is no extra pain. All this went into, the <coughs> into a file for submission for regulatory approvals through the MHRA and eventually SI. And I'm pleased to say that we did get UKCA and CE marking this year. In addition, the device has been patented and filed now across Europe, in the UK and also in the US. Though it has been a bit of a battle, particularly with the US uh, teams. 
Um, in our particular case, because of Brexit and because of COVID, there was a big delay between the results of the study and the final uh, award of devices. Otherwise, we would have been uh, at this point with uh, market delivery uh, about two years ago. Now, the field also changes, and you need to know that when you're developing your product because the timelines are long. And along that way, the transformation of the transact, the transparent of it became effectively endorsed by many bodies. And there's an international movement now to do away with transrectal biopsies because of the infection and sepsis risk. So hopefully the camp will be is, is on the, starting on a very good position where everyone is looking for an alternative. Uh, and hopefully that will improve uptake. So of course, on the flip side, there's also now a lot of other competitive devices out there. So in summary, uh, the biopsy device proved what we said it was going to do. No sepsis, low volumes of local anesthetic use, a simple coaxial system, as I've mentioned, and it's affordable. It's going to be pitched at a cost lower than most of the other competitors out there, which actually didn't exist when we started this project. Uh, and we think it's going to be easy to adopt and train. Patients like it, and it's fully patented in CE mark. Hopefully, with a large emerging market, as I mentioned, as um, globally there's a transition from transrectal to transperineal, um, you know, the camper was well positioned to take advantage of that market. But obviously, uh, it is a competitive market. I will finish off by uh, putting this timeline here. The journey has been long from 2014 to 2023, so it's about nine years now. Uh, I think we, we probably lost a couple of years, definitely, with COVID and Brexit. Uh, so you've got to be patient as well. But I'm pleased to say at the end of that journey, from what was effectively a drawing in the back of an envelope to a, uh, a stainless steel prototype developed in a hospital, we now have the final device, which Jeb, the device manufacturer company, did decide to take on and is being distributed in the UK through Henry's uh, and soon to be on the NHS supply chain. Surprisingly, this idea and concept was also been recognised by an Innovation Business Award uh, from the, our local uh, from our local um, uh, vicinity, and we were pleased to receive uh, the award uh, this year uh, from the Cambridge Business Life Awards. I'd like to finish there, and I hope that you've enjoyed um, the talk and presentation, and it's been as clear as it can be. Um, if there are any questions or anyone like to reach out to me, I'm very happy to speak to anyone, and I'm easily contactable uh, through my email address, uh, which is available on the web or the University of Cambridge. Thank you for your kind attention.